Welcome to uh, our Wisdom Wednesday presentation for this week. Today uh, we have Dr. Robert Keene from, uh, uh, he's the uh, chief historian for Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, he spent 27 years in the Air Force before retiring as a lieutenant colonel. And uh, he has published a, a book uh, entitled Far From Home, which is an account of the uh, story of the Royal Air Force and free French flight training programs in central Alabama during World War II. He covers its origins, issues, and problems that occurred during the training programs and the results and the lessons learned. Dr. Keene uh, teaches part-time at Troy University and uh, at the American Military University in West Virginia. And he's received numerous Air Force awards. He's the author of another book, uh, Disobedience and Conspiracy in the German Army, 1918 to 1945. He's published book reviews and short articles for various encyclopedias. And so uh, I'd like to welcome you now to this presentation, which I think will be an interesting one, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So, Dr. Keene. Uh, to start off, um, not that there's anyone needs, uh, if you didn't mention I have published, this is a condensation of my book, So Far From Home. I did bring some copies, so if anyone's interested in purchasing afterwards, uh, I'm selling them for $25. It's a little bit less than what you would purchase if all, you would buy it from a publisher, but again, it's just if you're interested. Uh, this is the product of, um, as, uh, as you say, John was saying, I'm retired Air Force. Uh, about uh, oh, uh, 2009, I discovered that I had uh, 15 months of VA education benefits, and I already had a PhD, so I was trying to figure out what I'm going to do. They told me I get $900 a month, but I had to use it within five years of when I was making the inquiry. So I decided to take a second master's, and the, uh, the book is the published account of the, of the thesis that I wrote for that, co for that program. And this is a synopsis. Now, I always want to ask, how many knew that, we that the Army Air Force has trained international air forces during World War II? How many knew that we trained them here in Alabama? And uh, this is a, just an account. Uh, uh, there were other, uh, uh, the British, French, uh, uh, trained uh, also at Selma, Craig Field at Selma, Vandegraaff Field in uh, Tuscaloosa. Uh, there were some at uh, Napier Field, which is uh, now the Dothan Airport, and a few other places, as well as Maxwell Gunner. This is a count of what occurred at Maxwell Field during World War II. Uh, I always start out, a good Air Force briefing has three main, uh, three main points. We have four to cover uh, our, our presentation. The origins of the Allied Flight Training Program, the British, then the French, and uh, lessons, conclusions and lessons learned. The, uh, Origins of the Royal Air Force flight train began, we actually go back to the Battle of Britain. Uh, in summer and fall of 1944, the British were in a desperate fight with the German Air Force over in Britain, and they had no pilots, no airplanes, and no airfields to train new pilots. So they were hoping and looking to the United States. Uh, one program that was already not, that was operating in the summer of 1944 had been put together by a man named called, uh, Clayton Knight. Clayton Knight was a World War I veteran, uh, and what he was doing, along with some others, rec were recruiting certified civilian pilots in the United States, train them up to about 80 flight hours, then they would cross over into Canada, where they would enlist in the Royal Canadian Air Force and then uh, joined the fight in England as, uh, in that way. Uh, and they were, by, the end of the, by the end of the war, there were about 12,000, 15,000 Americans who did that. Uh, in addition, uh, and the British had approached us, the, uh, the, uh, it approached us uh, through Lynn Lease. Uh, we were looking how to pay for it. The British were running out of money. And so uh, U.S. Congress in uh, uh, March 1971 passed, 1941 passed the Lynn-Lease Act, which allowed the U.S. government to provide 
services to countries which we believe aided or helped in our national defense. And that was the way that uh, President Roosevelt got around the neutrality laws to help out the British uh, in the early years of the war. Another uh, method, uh, the Royal Air Force established six uh, flight schools at six airfields across the United States. There was one in Florida, uh, one couple in Texas, and so on. And they ran, we provided the airplanes, the, we provided the uh, land, but the British provided all of the instructors and they were trained according to the British flight training procedure, procedures. And uh, by the end of the war, almost 7,000 uh, candidates uh, were uh, trained in that way. Uh, in addition, during the war, the Royal Air Force contracted with the Army Air Forces to train uh, navigators. Uh, about uh, almost 1,800 uh, were trained at the uh, Pan American uh, Navigation School down in Coral, Coral Gables, Florida. That's where America, initially for the first couple of years of the war, where American navigators uh, flying the larger aircraft were trained. We also, in the, in the, I kind of aren't, the, uh, the uh, Navy, not wanting to stay out of it, the Chief of, Air, uh, the Chief of Aeronautics Naval Aviation at Rear Admiral John Towers put in his uh, bid, and in, in, during the war, they ended up training about 4,000 Royal Air Force uh, cadets for the Fleet Naval Air Arm. Uh, they flew, uh, mainly flew the large uh, PBY Catalina amphibian aircraft, uh, they were the big, big long range flying boats that could actually land on water, and they used them, they used them for anti submarine patrols over the North Sea. Uh, the North Atlantic, and also for air-sea rescue of downed pilots. The big program, though, was what came to be known as the Arnold Scheme. By, uh, by uh, early 1941, the United States had sent over a commission to find out what, did you, what the British needed. Uh, General uh, Arnold, General Henry Hap Arnold, the chief of the Army Air Corps himself, went over. And while he was there, he promised that, we, that he would commit up to one third of the training capacity of American flight schools to help uh, to train British pilots. And the, we ended up, deci we decided that all the flight schools would be located in the Southeast United States, primarily because of it was e easier access proximity to Britain across the Atlantic Ocean. In the end, the Arnold scheme of the Arnold program, as it was various names, it was called the Arnold Plan, trained, uh, 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 produced 4,360 graduates out of 7,800 cadets who came up here, came over here. That's a, a graduation rate of about 55%. Now, some, may, some of you may think, well, that's kind of a low number. Well, uh, in, in the research for the book, I found that discovered that the washout for the Americans was about the same. About 45% about of those who began flight training washed out and did not receive their wings. In fact, in, is, uh, as we're going to see the same, very similar situation with the French, the British and the French and the Americans had approximately the same percentage of washouts, the same percentage of accidents, and the same, about the same percentage who eventually got their wings. When, we, when I looked at the statistics, by and large, the largest number of people washed out, both, and it was not, again, not just the British or the French, it was also Americans, the largest percentage washed out uh, or failed to complete the phase one school. The schools were assigned to the Southeast Air Corps Training Center. The Army Air Corps, the War Department, established the Southeast Air Corps Training Center in, uh, in the summer of 1940, it was uh, originally led by Major General Walter Weaver. Uh, General Weaver had been the post commander at Maxwell back in 1927 through 29, uh, and, uh, but, and he had come back in, as a colonel in 1939, promoted to general, and then selected to command and established this huge training center. The uh, map here uh, gives you an idea of where the British the British uh, fly, uh, training centers were the different fields that were used in the Southeast United States where, they, where the British trained. Uh, 
The Southeast Air Corps Training Center was renamed the Eastern Flying Training Command in 1943 by the end of the war. It oversaw over 100 flight schools across the Southeast United States, including Southern Indiana and Southern Illinois, uh, Arkansas and Missouri. Uh, among those who, those who were trained, uh, I was talking to the individual earlier, there was about 300 uh, Dutch, Indo-Dutch, who were trained in Mississippi. There was a couple of hundred, uh, there was uh, ultimately 2,000 Chinese flight cadets who were trained. There were some who were trained down in Florida. There were Mexicans in training. And, and for us, for us, uh, as part of Alabama history, we all know, or should know, we all know that the uh, first, com uh, the first African Americans who were combat pilots, the Tuskegee Airmen, were trained literally just right down the road. Uh, again, it was a segregated military, so, so the, uh, the uh, three main uh, flight schools, they had all of the three main flight schools for the cadet aviation program were located at various airfields around Tuskegee. And it, they trained oh, uh, over a hundred, over a thousand pilots had completed the training by the end of the war, 900 of which uh, eventually saw combat. And in addition, again, being a second grade military, there are 14,000, 14,000 African Americans, both men and women, who served as uh, in various administrative and uh, capacities and support capacities for the uh, pilot cadets that were at, uh, at Tuskegee and later who went overseas to North Africa and Italy who saw combat. This uh, chart shows the main phases of the, uh, the uh, Army Air Forces flight training program during World War II. The three basic, there were uh, three basic actually flying training uh, phases. The basic, phase one, primary is phase two. The advanced school is phase three. By the, uh, by the uh, uh, by 19, in the 1942, early 43, the Army Air Forces had figured out because of the, lar the large number of washouts, they created a pre-flight or ground school where, where, where potential cadets went and they did a, a, some initial work to determine if they had an aptitude for flying. And, and so it was at either a pre-flight or the primary school where we had the largest number of washouts. Those who would not make flying, uh, complete the flying training, most of them were returned to uh, enlisted to, to, just uh, enlisted uh, career fields. Some of them went, but were allowed to go back. Some of them became bombardiers or navigators on the uh, larger aircraft. Uh, by the end, as you can see here, by the end of the primary school, this is phase two, they were all nine weeks. By the end of the uh, primary school, the Army Air Forces, through a classification system, figured out which pilots or which cadets would go to a single engine school, such as we had at uh, Craigfield and Selma, where they would learn to fly a fighter aircraft. Or, and the others went to a twin engine school, like at Turner Field, Georgia, where they learned how, and they would become either transport or bomber pilots. Once they finished the advanced school, those who finished the advanced schools received a commission as a second lieutenant and their aviator wings. At that point, they were then sent, sent to a transition school where they learned to fly the specific plane that they would end up flying in combat. For example, at Maxwell Field at the, so in late 1943 through uh, 1945, there was a B-24 Liberator uh, bomber and then uh, followed by a B-29 bomber transition school where pilots who would become who would fly those aircraft, learn how to fly that aircraft here in the United States. The last phase, or the, act, the real actual last phase, was the operational. When a pilot, a pilot or a crew were assigned to an operational unit overseas, that unit would fly them generally for a couple of days or a couple of weeks in non-combatant non, non areas in order to let them get used to the terrain, the, uh, the uh, terrain features and so on, and then gradually move them into combat. Since we are, we are talking about Maxwell, Gun, uh, and, uh, Maxwell and Gunner Field, Maxwell Field had a phase three school or advanced school 
from November 1940 to August 1942. Gunner Field, which was established in November 1940, it's on the north side of Montgomery, they had, it had a phase two school, or primary school. The, uh, we should see here the Vulti BT-13 and later an upgraded version, a version with an upgraded engine, the BT-15, uh, was the primary trainer for the basic or phase two school. The uh, North American AT-6 Texan was the primary trainer for the advanced schools and then starting in, uh, throughout the war and then starting in mid-1943, the Army Air Forces began replacing the BT-13s and 15s with the AT-6 Texan in the uh, primary school. Both of these, this is the, uh, the uh, picture over here with the, shows a, uh, a uh, Vulti, uh, a BT-13 that was stationed at Maxwell, that's what the M stands for, uh, in, the, in the late 1940, 19, early 1941, when the primary school was there at Maxwell. The uh, second photo with the AT-67, that's an actual uh, photo of AT-6 Texans on the flight line at Maxwell Field during World War II. Just some statistics. Uh, we're going to look at the RAF flight training. The first cadets for uh, the Royal Air Force came here in June 1941. One of those, unfortunately, got, was sick, was put in a base hospital for a while, but the flight training at Maxwell started, and at Gunner, started in June 1941. The uh, students, the cadets, would cross the Atlantic on one of the big uh, countered liners like the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth because they could travel at 45, 45 knots, which was twice the speed of a German U-boat. So they could bring lots of, lots of them over. Uh, well, they, could, they could sail without escort because they were twice as fast as a German U-boat. They would uh, land at Halifax, Nova Scotia and disembark the uh, prospective cadets. While they were in Canada, they would be processed. Then they would be told where, what school they were going, they were being assigned to. They would see, receive some clothes uh, and a ticket, a train ticket to their uh, flight station, uh, flight school. Now, in between June 1941, and December 1941, we were not at war. So the British cadets who came here during that time frame traveled from Canada to their flight school in the United States in civilian clothes. Now, after uh, Pearl Harbor and we were in, in, in the war, obviously they could tra travel in their uh, RAF uniforms, but in the first couple of months, they would travel from Canada to the into the United States to their flight school in uh, civilian clothes. Here's the, some, the statistics. Uh, during, uh, from uh, June 1941 to February 1943, the phase two school at Maxwell, uh, I mean the phase three school at Maxwell, graduated, uh, you see the overall numbers, 7,860, 4,360 uh, 4, graduated all overall. At the uh, Gunner Primary School, you can see that almost all of the cadets that attended from that period of time uh, went on to a phase three school. And uh, Maxwell, again, the number uh, 446 is small because in August, in July 1942, the, it was decided to close the Phase II school at Maxwell, replace it with a transition school, and, uh, and, so, uh, and then it was also replaced by a flight instructor school. Uh, that's what this other number here is, the 457. Uh, in the first couple of years of the war, all of the Army Air Force flight schools were short of flight instructors. A decision was made in, in uh, early 1942 that some of the RAF cadets who completed the advanced school would become flight instructors and sent to airfields which had a large RAF contingent. So a number of, that's, uh, and that was there at Maxwell for a year. So a significant number of the graduates of the Maxwell Phase three school, those who, uh, the, the RAF cadets who graduated, went up, attended the, uh, so, uh, the two-month flight instructor school at Maxwell, and many of them actually went on and just went across the city 
across the city to Gunner Field where they were trained uh, Royal Air Force cadets and uh, that, that was done to help alleviate uh, the flight instructor shortage at, be, at the beginning of the, year, uh, the war. Now, interesting enough, I mentioned after an American cadet finished all three phases, he would get his aviator wings and a commission as a second lieutenant. Not so the Royal Air Force. The Royal Air Force, uh, uh, there was a, a Royal, what was called the Royal Air Force delegation. That was the, that was a Royal Air Force contingent in the British Embassy in uh, Washington that sat with the uh, uh, air attaché from Britain, and along with the school, the schools, they would decide, they would decide of the graduates from an advanced school which third, the top third, which was the top third, because only the top third of the Royal Air Force cadets coming out of the advanced school would receive an officer's commission. The rest of them, the other two thirds, be, became enlisted pilots and a large number of them ended up flying uh, Royal Air Force bombers. Uh, if you know, during World War II, Royal Air Force Bomber Command was flying uh, nighttime uh, bombing raids over Germany, which was very high risk. I don't know if there was a decision that the, the enlisted folks could be a, were more expendable than officers. Uh, I don't know why, why uh, I don't have a, a real understanding of why the Royal Air Force only commissioned one, thir one third, but that's, that was their procedure. They commissioned the top third and the rest of them, uh, the other two thirds became enlisted pilots. Now again, we're talking about statistics. You look up here, these are the statistics the, uh, in the, uh, Air Force Historical Research Agency, which is also at Maxwell, uh, that's where I did most of my research for the book, I discovered that the actual statistics for each class, uh, each class, uh, and which included Americans and then, uh, and then the internationals, and in, 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 in calculating the numbers, we see that, uh, you can see that the primary, the elimination rates for the Americans and the British from the primary, basic, and the advanced schools, oh, an overall elimination rate was approximately the same as the American rate. Uh, this is a picture of during the war, during the time from June 1941 to February 1943 when the British Air Force was conducting training here uh, at the, uh, at the, uh, in the southeast. 78 of the cadets died in aircraft accidents. The worst situation or the worst case occurred on March 7, 1942. A flight of seven planes uh, from, took off from Gunner, that's the primary, to phase two school. Most of them had flight instructors. Their mission was, to, was a cross-country flight during the afternoon down the Crestview, Florida, where they would land, refuel, and fly back before dark. Once they got the crest view, however, a, a front of thunderstorms had moved over the area, and in the attempt of trying to get back, five of those airplanes crashed, killing five cadets and two instructor pilots. Uh, in the investigation that followed, a decision was decided to reassign the school commandant and reassign the weather forecaster. Uh, there was no, there was no uh, record that they were uh, actually further disciplined other than being reassigned. But uh, also they, they decided to uh, uh, terminate night flying for the uh, 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 primary school, the phase two school that was at Gunner. So during, uh, during that training period, uh, 78 RAF cadets died in flight training. Most of them are buried in a special section of Oakwood Cemetery. If you've been to Montgomery, Oakwood Cemetery is literally on the north side of the Montgomery Police Department. If you go there, you can uh, maybe the best way is to follow the signs to the Hank Williams uh, a memorial uh, uh, grave site. Uh, of, when you get to that section, you'll see the larger section for the British flight cadets. Next to them is a smaller section for the French flight cadets. And just to the uh, right of the uh, French grave sites is the Hank, w Hank Williams Memorial grave site. 
in Oakwood Cemetery. Um, in September 1942, the British government decided to terminate the Royal Air Force flight training at the airfields in, in the southeast United States. Now, they did not terminate the flight training that was occurring at those six contract schools I had mentioned, but they did terminate the one, the training at, in those schools in the southeast. By that time, the British, had, the British and British Commonwealth nations had, had, well, had developed a, well, uh, a very expansive flight training program of their own called the British Empire Flight Training Program. By the end, with, uh, they had uh, schools uh, all over Canada, some in Australia, a couple in uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa, and the, and the British colonies in South Africa. And by the end of the war, they would, would have trained 160,000 flight cadets. So this program demonstrated our support for the British government at a time of their need and served as an interim until the British government got their much more expansive flight training program going and up to speed. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, not sure why the pictures are not showing. Uh, there are some pictures here, but they're not showing for some reason. What was the reaction of the Royal, of the cadets to the training? Well, they were, made, they were trained according to the American system of flight training. Up until, uh, uh, literally up until uh, late 1942, there was the upper class and the lower class. The uh, lower class British cadets resented the upper class American cadets who they could assess the merits. They had to put this uh, uh, fold clothes and how to keep their room, don't barracks rooms in certain, uh, certain ways. And they, and they would get a crew of uh, demerits. Uh, there was one in situation where the, uh, the uh, school commandant at the phase one school at Selma, Craig Field, had allowed nine RAF cadets who had mustaches to complete the flight training at Selma at Craig Field, but when they were reassigned to the phase two school at Gunner, the, flight co the school commandant made them uh, uh, cut their mustaches off because we, didn't, we Americans were not allowed to wear mustaches, so he was making the British adhere to the American standards. Well, the commander of the Southeast Air Corps Training Center was receiving so many complaints, even from Americans about this, the hazing and the demerit system, that in early 1943, he uh, did away with that, with, the, with that system altogether, not just for the British, but for all, for the Americans. Uh, they, were eat, they were forced to eat square meals. Anyone heard that term, a square meal? We, some of you, there, there are two, actually two connotations. One means to eat a balanced meal, but in terms of the military, a square meal means that you marched into the dining hall, the mess hall, you stood at attention until everybody around your table was situated behind a chair, you in unison got in your chair and you ate with your back braced to the back of the chair, and you would get your food up, across, across, down, up and across. That was eating a square meal. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, it, it, it used, I don't know if it's still done, but it used to be done in our military academies. Uh, the British felt that the, uh, the American flight instructors favored the Americans. Again, they were picking on them for uh, 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 minor things, and the Americans felt that the uh, British were daredevils. Some of the British flight cadets who came here had, had some flight, uh, flight time in Britain already, and they, those especially did not like the hazing and the being picked on uh, because of their flying abilities. Now, in general, the, raw, the RAF cadets liked being in the South. Uh, they weren't, obviously, if you've been, anyone had been to Britain, they were not used to the hot, humid summers. In fact, many of us today, you know, we always say, oh, thank God for air conditioning. We don't know what we would do without air conditioning. So you imagine a large group of people who came from a cold, uh, a colder climate in general over the year. Uh, they would, uh, 
they would go downtown. I read an article in the Montgomery Advertiser where a reporter was asking him, well, what did you think about our historic buildings? Well, imagine in Montgomery, a historic building is one from the 1880s. In Britain, an historic building is one from 1,000, about 800 years older than whatever we could produce in the United States. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the article said that some of the, the, one of the cadets said he was more, uh, more uh, interested in the coin-operating op coin vending machines that they found than they were in Montgomery's quote-unquote historic buildings. There was one question, well, how do you find the southern draw? And the cadet was kind of, I got in the matter, was kind of chuckle and says, well, of course we can understand the southern draw because we've become used to the rolling otters of our Scottish friends up north. So, uh, uh, and they get different kinds of comments. In general, the American, the, the Montgomery population loved them. There's a, uh, uh, the uh, RAF cadets marched in uniform in the uh, Armistice, Day, Armistice Day Parade, November 11th, 1941, downtown Montgomery. According to the Montgomery uh, artic, uh, uh, advertiser, the American onsite, the Montgomerians who's watching, cheered the British on louder than the Americans because, you know, as you know, the, uh, the British marched at a different cadence and step than the Americans. And uh, there were some cadets who met and married uh, local women. I, uh, I actually met the daughter of an IRF cadet. He, had, uh, he had, uh, did his phase one training at, at Craigfield Selma. He came to Gunner for his phase two training. He ended up graduating his, uh, and getting his commission from the advanced school at Maxwell in the summer of 1942. While he was at Selma, he met a young lady, a, a, a lady named Jean, Jean Harmon, who lived in Wetumpka, a you know, little town just north of Montgomery. Uh, they fell in love, and in October 1942, they got married. Well, when the program ended in February 1943, uh, John Clark, that was his name, was reassigned, sent back to uh, Britain. Uh, he became a flight instructor at a British airfield for the duration of the war. Six months after he left, his wife was able to follow him as an employee of the American Red Cross in London. So they were able to get, and, and there were others uh, who, who married local women. Uh, they were, uh, they were uh, some of the main, two, the really main two issues with the Royal Air Force cadets is when they came here, they initially had no orientation. There was no program to introduce them to American culture, American history, American government. But by, uh, by, uh, uh, early, by late 1942, when the Army Air Force introduced the uh, pre-flight school for the British, for the uh, international students, there were, uh, a couple of, uh, there were a couple hours that were devoted to American culture and history to kind of give them an introduction into the United States. There was also no official sponsor program. During weekends, they would go out on their own, they, uh, or they, as you see here, many were, um, were invited to uh, teas and dances and social events in Montgomery. And, and around, I found an article where a, uh, uh, a fairly wealthy uh, family down in uh, Lounsboro had, a, a, they called it a mansion, I think it was just a very large house, but invited a group of American and British flight cadets down for, uh, down for a picnic one Saturday afternoon. So, but that, that was all ad hoc. There was no official program to ensure that the, the to, to provide them with, uh, you know, introduction to America when they were here. As I mentioned, with the, uh, with once the uh, British Empire uh, tr Commonwealth training plan was well underway, and was producing large number of uh, uh, crews, uh, pilots and co-pilots from the Commonwealth schools. To September 1942, the Royal Air Force delegation made a decision that the, that portion, the Arnold program, would, would come to an end with the start of the class that was starting in September 1942, meaning it would graduate at the end of February 1943. And so that was the end of the British flight training program. Beginning, I thought there was a
beginning in, um, as one, it was kind of ironic that once the British flight training plan was winding down, the free French were wanting to wind up. If, uh, remember from your history, November 1942, Operation Torch, British and American troops went ashore at various places on the North African, Western North African coast in Operation Torch. By, uh, uh, by February, end of February, March of 1943, much of North Africa was cleared. The remaining Axis uh, troops would surrender or be cleared from North Africa when they surrendered in May 1943 in Tunisia. While in that interim, that interim period, the Free French under General Charles de Gaulle was asking about uh, Lindley's aid for Free French forces and specifically been, uh, began asking about flight training to build up his air force, a small, build up a small air force for the Free French. By the middle of 1943, the Free French Air Force consisted of a couple of fighter squadrons a couple of bomber squadrons and a transport squadron. He was, and de Gaulle wanted to build up his Air Force to contribute more significantly, not just to the, the war, the combat, uh, aerial combat in the Mediterranean, but ultimately to participate in the liberation of France itself when the Allies would launch uh, the cross-channel uh, cross invasion uh, that occurred in June 1944. So, our uh, local commanders, local American commanders in North Africa found that there were a couple of thousand trained French flight officers and, and a couple of thousand maintenance, crew, crewmen and maintenance. So they began, they started up some flight schools there and that is when and by, uh, June, by May 1943 a formal proposal was made by de Gaulle to initiate a formal training program in the United States on the lines of the Arnold program, but for free French air uh, uh, cadets. Now the French posed several pro issues. First of all, they weren't in the large numbers as the British. The British put a couple, would put a, a four or five hundred on a, on a uh, ocean going liner to Canada. The, French could muster uh, something like 20 to 30 on any given 20 or 30. So the Americans, what we decided to do is they would come across the North Atlantic, or the actual the Central Atlantic, the Middle Atlantic, and land at Norfolk, Virginia. There they would come down, they would all again be trained at uh, airfield schools in the Southeast United States. They would initially all go to Craig Field. There they would be held until they got a group of 100. And with a group of 100, they would start a class. Because what we want, what we would do, what we did and with the British, what we did with our own, is when a group of, of cadets start, flight cadets started a class, the phase one or the pre-flight, then they would be successfully moved all the way through the flight training program until they got their wings and their commission. So we were doing that with the uh, French, but we would hold them until we had a, a class of four, a, a class of 100, and then they would start their formal uh, phase one training. Uh, just to give an example, Van de Graaff Field, uh, anyone been to Tuscaloosa, the Tuscaloosa Regional Airport? That used to be an Army airfield. They trained British and French cadets in a phase two school during the war. So, and the gunner, uh, I don't show the overall, but I do, since this presentation is focused on Ma Maxwell and Gunner, the Gunner uh, primary school was the only primary school for the French. So you can see here, almost all of them who began the phase two training ended up completing uh, and getting their, uh, getting their aviation wings in commission. Again, you here see the uh, elimination rate. Pro again, the same statistics for the Americans as you've seen with the British, but compare them with the French. About the same number. Now, uh, not exactly, but statist statistically speaking, approximately the same number, the same percentage of French cadets were eliminated from, uh, from each one of the different phases. 
during the, uh, during the uh, period of time, June 1943 to October 1945, when we were hosting free French flight training, 20 uh, cadets died in flight training. Most of them, along with a few others, uh, other French military who were in the United States undergoing uh, uh, military training, were buried next to their British comrades in the uh, special section in Oakwood Cemetery, just north of the, uh, of the uh, Montgomery Police Department. As I said, if you ever got out to that area, just ask directions to the Hank Williams uh, Memorial Gravesite, because right next on the left side are the French, and on the left side of the French are the British gravesites. So what were some of the problems with the uh, Free French? Well, the biggest problem was the language. The biggest problem was the language. None of the French cadets spoke English. The uh, Army Air Forces scoured the flight schools across the Southeast United States for French speaking um, uh, flight instructors, that, that would include anyone who had been to France, anyone who had taken French in high school in co or college. That include, would include uh, people from Louisiana who spoke Cajun French. And if you know anything about Cajun French, Cajun French in relation to classical spoken French is about the same difference as Southernese is to regular English. It's understandable, but so it was not, and it was not just the, the spoken word. All the flight manuals had to be translated into French. During the period of time we were training the French, they, the, the, uh, South, the uh, Eastern Flight and Training Command were, were regularly revising the flight manuals from English to French because, as we should know, you can't directly translate one language directly into another language word for word. There are idioms and there's technical terms that, that uh, you, you can't uh, translate directly. The, uh, in the, in the uh, school, in the classes themselves, they tried dual instruction. They would have a French speaker translate, or the, the American instructor would say about a couple, of, would say something in English, that would get translated into French. But that meant dual translation meant double the time in class. They tried uh, for a short period of time having an additional two hours of uh, class time at the end of the day in conversational English for the French cadets. Well, that turned a 10-hour day into a 12-hour day. So that didn't work. Well, when I say it didn't work, it was not the, none of these were the best solutions. Then you come up with the problem of the actual flight training. The trainers were two-seaters. That means you had a French cadet in the front and a flight instructor in the back. There's no place to put a translator. So what they did is hire, they contracted with French speakers, speakers and so when they did, when they were, once they were out of the class and they were briefing the cadet on what they were going to do in the flight lesson, the English, the American speaking flight instructor would tell in English what they were going to do. That would get translated into French by a translator. The student would ask questions in French, which gets translated into English to the flight instructor. And when they finished the flight lesson, they reversed the process to see what the student had learned. But that's still, there's still the problem, what about when you're out there flying around? Well, the flight instructors in American ingenuity or human ingenuity developed, they, the flight instructors and the students developed a system of gestures. The flight instructor would do something with his fingers, like one finger or two fingers, or certain fingers meant to the flight student, to the cadet, the maneuver he was supposed to do and he would perform the maneuver. And that's why when you look at the accident rate and the washout rate, why is it important to recognize that with the French, and by the way, it wasn't just the French, it was other, because uh, uh, by the end of the war, we had trained 29,000 internationals. 
from 31 different countries, some of many of which English was not the primary language. And yet, we still ended up with similar uh, washout rates and accident rates, which basically, to me, indicates the determination of the French cadets to complete the course. Of course, the, in the case of the French, they had a very, very strong motivation. They expected to go back to Europe and participate in the liberation of France from the Germans. What their reaction to the southern atmosphere? Well, again, they were used to French cuisine. They weren't used to the kinds of foods we eat in the south. As you know, we fry everything. I, 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 was, I, I didn't realize until about, five, about six, seven years ago, we even fried pickles. I knew about fried okra. I grew up in the south. I knew about fried okra. And everybody knows fried chicken, fried potatoes. But I, I didn't know we fried pickles. But we, you know, we fry everything. They weren't used to that. One of the hard, one of the issues that they could, one of the things they couldn't understand is the southern prejudice towards African Americans. The uh, French uh, had a, had uh, large expanses of territory in Africa populated by uh, Black Africans. In World War Two, as well as World War Two, World War One, as well as World War Two. The French army used large numbers of colonial troops from their colonies in Africa. And they didn't, uh, during the interwar period, a number of uh, famous Americans like Josephine Baker left the United States to become expatriates in, in France where they did not have to undergo the, the type of prejudices and restrictions that, we found, that they found in the United States. Because they, they didn't, I won't say they didn't exist, but they certainly weren't as prominent on uh, display. And, they, and the, the, uh, I, I actually read a comment where one of the French cadets says, I do not understand how you Americans love jazz music, which, as you know, is an uh, a, a original derived from African, uh, uh, black African music, how you uh, like jazz music, but you don't like African Americans, black Americans. Uh, as the uh, British and, uh, and other places, they spent their after weekends in uh, various social events. For those that were here at Montgomery, uh, many of them would go to would tra would hitchhike or tra travel up to Birmingham, which apparently had a larger French-speaking community for, uh, than, uh, than Montgomery. And again, some of them would marry American women. Um, like the British uh, and other flight training programs, they, they lacked, uh, initially lacked an orientation, which was remedied by the introduction of short uh, period, short classes uh, during, at the, by the end of the war. There was no uh, official sponsor program. And as I said, there was, uh, there was all the all issues of the language, the language barrier. So the results. The results, you know, we have to divide the results into two groups. For the British, we, for the British, well, the numbers that we trained for the British were a drop in the bucket by the end of the war compared to their British Commonwealth flight training program. We trained, uh, graduated uh, uh, 4,300. They graduated over 160,000. But it came at a very crucial period for Britain. Britain was running out of money. They were under, under daily aerial attack by the German Air Force. They did not have the, the pilots, the airplanes, or the airfields to train replacement crews. So that was why they initially looked to the United States for help to provide that initial group of flight cadets, of replacement pilots, until the British government could get their own flight training program up and going. The French was quite different. Uh, I, in, in looking at the statistics of how many pilots that the French Air, Free French Air Force had in, in the summer of 1943, the number that were killed by the end of the war, and the numbers that we trained here in flight schools in the southeast United States, by the way, most of them, almost all of them, were here in Alabama. The only flight school that was not in Alabama was the two-engine school at Turner Field, Albany, Georgia. Uh, 
but all of the free French flight training occurred here in Alabama. By the end of the war, the majority of the surviving pilots had been trained at flight, American flight schools here in Alabama. So that meant the cadre, the, post, the initial post-war French Air Force, was over 50% manned by pilots and crews that we had trained during the war. Also, uh, it demonstrated the need for, um, for some sort of orientation program to provide international officers with some sort of basic understanding of the United States, government, culture, history. So when we started training internationals after the in, beginning of the Cold War in 1949, very quickly all of the American military schools that were training or educating international officers had some sort of spot, had some sort of orientation program that the internationals completed before they started their formal uh, American uh, training or, or education programs. It also demonstrated the need for sponsor programs, uh, to, to especially those who are going to be here for a long, a fairly long period of time. Maxwell has two officer professional military edu education programs that are 10 months long. Those officers, those internationals that come for those schools get to bring their families. So they, uh, back starting in the mid-1950s, they have had families, local families in the Montgomery area will host an international family. My wife and I have been doing, hosting uh, families from Indonesia since uh, the summer of 2003. We have a, social, a couple of socials a year at our home. We show them what our lifestyle is like, uh, which is not to say that's not what everybody's is, but it's what ours is like. So they get a little taste of America. If they have some issues, they can come to the sponsor and says, I'm having a little problem with this or that, and depending on what it is, we can help, help them solve it, or we can point them in the right direction to find help. Probably the most important lesson learned of the flight training program was the, the absolute need for international students coming from non-English speaking countries to ha have a, com on a speci specified level of English comprehension, both conversational and reading, before they came here. As I've explained, the, the issues, the language problem with the Free French and Gunner was the most extensive problem I, that I have found with the entire flight training program because the French did not understand English and even we, and we did never had enough French-speaking French instructors. So it became imperative after the war when we began training and educating internationals that those that come from countries where English is not the first language, they had to obtain some level of and be tested for a specified level of English prior to their, as part of their selection process to attend uh, one of the schools or one of the programs we have. That is the end of the presentation, uh, uh, the formal presentation. We do have time if you, about, uh, if you have any questions. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, the Army Air Force uh, uh, flight training, the, the, the people that oversaw flight training figured out very quickly that the highest rate of washout occurred in the phase one, the primary, the, the, the uh, primary school. I always, I get confused because primary and basic, basic seems to me we should be the uh, phase one, but it's the phase two. The primary or phase one school is wh where the largest number of washouts occurred. And by the middle of the war, the Army Air Forces, though the experts had f finally figured out they needed to have, uh, that while they were waiting to start a flight school, they needed to go through, they, they put them through a ground school. 
And part of why that ground school was to determine their uh, aptability for flying. Not everybody can fly an airplane. And, and, and at the beginning of the war, that's what we were doing. We were selecting people and sending them to flight school without doing any real testing for their abil ability to fly. Well, that's when, we, when the Army Air Forces instituted that pre-flight school where there was testing to, done to determine if, they, if, if, if individuals had a, apt, a capability to fly, and then they would be, assign them to the flight, the flight uh, the phase one school, and that, again, is where the largest number of washouts occurred. Now, the, we, were, we were going to get some, money out, some money's worth out of them. Those who washed out of a phase one or a phase two school some of them got the chance to go back, go back. Oh, very few would, go, would be entered back at the beginning and start all over, very few. Most of them, or a lot, a lot of them would be sent, would be then reassigned to a school where they learned how to be a bombardier or a navigator. They already had some flight training so, in, in, so they could act as a third person on a larger, one of the bigger airplanes, the multi-crew airplanes, who had some flight training that if the pilot or the co-pilot were injured, they could bring in the airplane, but they would, they would be sent to a bombardier or, or a uh, navigator school. Some would turn and, and we sent back to an enlisted support, uh, uh, especially some of them would become radio operators and gunners aboard uh, uh, that would eventually serve on a bomber uh, or, or a transport. Any other questions? Yes, sir. And, and, and the British rank structure, the sergeant pilot would be a rank above the enlisted people that were in the rest of the airplane. Right, right. Now, um, the, uh, trying, the, that's exactly right. Now, the French, again, because the French, uh, meant some, as part of their depending if they were to, if a person was designated to fly a single engine fighter, somewhere in their advanced flight training, they would, that person would go to a fixed gunnery school and learn how to fire the machine guns. They were either in the uh, nose of the airplane or in the wings, they were fixed. Uh, so they went to a fixed gunnery school for a couple of weeks as part of the phase three training. If, in the case of the, the French, uh, uh, if, they, if, they, if a person was ultimately going to fly a bomber, as part of the multi-engine training school, the third, the third phase, they would go to a flexible gunner, gunnery school. And they call it flexible because, again, the, you, you know, they, swivel, they usually swiveled some way in a manner. They weren't fixed. They were movable, uh, either in the nose or, or along the fuselage of the airplane. But they would learn how to fire, uh, uh, go to a flexible gunnery school as part of the advanced school training program. And in case, I know in case of the French, because we trained 4,000 French, only 2,000 were pilots. The others were flight engineers, gunners, or, and or radio men flying who would, be, who would end up being crew members. We, we, uh, equipped, a, we equipped a significant number of uh, free French squadrons with the B-25 uh, two-engine airplane, the Mitchell bomber, and they, uh, medium bombers, and they would fly, uh, the, so they, they had a crew of five, a pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, navigator, and two gunners, and who also served as flight engineers. So among the 4,000 French were those who went to, were the enlisted who went to uh, a, uh, a, a, gun, uh, a gunnery school or a navigator school or a flight engineer school. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
uh, I, I think uh, Canada, once Canada, once, uh, once the war, Canada was in helping the uh, Britain right from the start of World War I, II. They were already sending Royal Canadian Air Force squadrons to Britain to fly, fight alongside the RAF. So they had their own training program, but like others, they had to ramp it up, and their flight training program became uh, part of this overall British uh, Commonwealth flight training plan that ultimately produced 160,000 graduates. So they did. I'm sure they did from Quebec. I, I don't know if any, any of them were sent. Were sent. Uh, if that, I don't even know if that was actually thought about, to tell you the truth. I do know that going back, the, there, were, there were like 12, 14,000 Americans who joined the Royal Canadian Air Force before uh, Pearl Harbor. Once the war, we got involved in a war, about 9,000 of them returned to the United States, went through the, most of them went through a, would, go, would be assigned to a phase three school, complete the phase three school, and then they would uh, be assigned to an Army Air Force squadron somewhere. So about 9,000 of the 13, 14,000 who joined the Royal Canadian Air Force came back and served with the Army Air Forces during the war. Yes, yes, that's uh, first of all, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, they, I don't know how many uh, there were about, uh, in, by the time the, uh, the middle of the war, about 12, 12 14,000 Americans had joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, and a large number of their squadrons were fighting in Britain and North Africa alongside the Royal Air Force. And they were, they were, they were enmeshed or embedded amongst other Canadians. They, now, the Royal Air Force did field two or three hundred percent American uh, man, uh, uh, RAF squadrons. These were Americans who went to Britain and joined the Royal Air Force. A, these were the Eagle Squadrons, and there are about four or five of them. They were all 100% uh, American man with British officers commanding, and they were part of the Royal Air Force until we got involved in the war. There are larger, a larger numbers of Americans who joined the Royal Air Force as individuals and fought as individuals sprinkled among the different British squadrons. They would have been trained in Britain, or, may, or, or they, some of them could have been trained in Canada, or they would have been trained in, if they went direct to Britain, they would have been trained in Britain. Uh, I, I did not run across anything in the evidence. There's only, this is the only, my book is the only one published about the British and French training here in Maxwell. A uh, South Carolina professor, Dr. Quinn, wrote a 500 pl pl plus page definitive history of the Arnold Plan, the total British, French, uh, British flight training program in the United States. And in, re in looking at his book and re reading it, I did not see where there were any indications that Americans who had gone to Britain directly and were embedded in Royal Air Force flight squadrons where they came back. Uh, I'm sure there were some, and there were many, but they, would be tr they, they were not part of the Arnold program specifically, and this is what we're, I, 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 I was researching here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, uh, you, uh, one can go online. It's kind of different. You could actually find uh, uh, Wikipedia. I, well, it's not definitive. Wikipedia does have an article on the Free French Air Force during World War II. They had a, a numbers of P-47, P-51 fighter squadrons. They had a, relative, uh, a number of... Uh, 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 medium bomber squadrons equipped with the B-25 uh, Mitchell bomber or the A-26. Uh, I, can't, I, I can't remember what the designation for the A-26, but it was either the A-26 or the B-25. Both of them were twin-engine medium bombers. And, the, uh, 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 and I, I, I'm, I would suspect that a French historian has written about the Free French Air Force during World War II, but.
I haven't seen, I only seen a couple of articles on the internet in English and, 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 and outside of bonjour, uh, 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 bonjour I, can, I don't speak French. Any other questions or comments? Uh, well, I enjoyed it. I hope I can get invited back sometime. I hope you think I was uh, interesting. Uh, like I said, I do have some books for sale if anyone is interested in purchasing uh, a book. Uh, if you have a pen, I take a check or cash, and if you have a pen, I'll sign it for you, which means in about 100 years, it'll probably be worth $26. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. King. Well, I'm glad I could be here. I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm going to send, uh, send y'all a list of other topics, so if you can fit me in in the next couple of months or think about me for next year, uh, I'm willing to come back. Uh, we're only about 45 minutes.